Welcome to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our lecture 11, um, and it is my pleasure to have an invited talk here from my PhD student, Shadi Barakat, who is really an expert in applications of HPC in the health and medical sciences. And he will tell us a little bit more about it. So Shadi, maybe introduce shortly yourself. Yeah, thank you, Morris. Uh, so my name is Shadi Barakat. I'm, um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Iceland uh, under Morris. And I'm also a, a researcher at the uh, Forschungszentrum Jülich in Germany, in Jülich. And uh, for my PhD, I'm doing some work in applications in health sciences using simulations and uh, neural networks, uh, deep learning, all for applications in improving healthcare uh, and outcomes for patients in the ICU. So uh, I hope that my insight in this matter is helpful to the students in your class, Morris. And I hope that this lecture that I'm going to give today will, uh, will provide all of this insight that would help them maybe see the path in their careers or uh, maybe see the possibilities that they could apply their research into. Yeah, all right. So, but before we dive into the material of the health sciences, let us maybe shortly review what we had the last time in uh, practical lecture 10.2. Okay. So um, basically the last time you heard from Rocco, who is really an expert in the remote sensing area, so different area than Chadi, but also very computational demanding. And you have seen that he is applying, let's say, GPUs at scale for specific algorithms in the AI field. And one of those was a so-called residual network that you see here on the left-hand side, which is really not the one that you know from your class with the MNIST and character recognition, but rather really a cutting edge um, deep learning network with so-called skip connections that you see there. Uh, the long story short is that this is a lot of uh, trainable parameters, right? And every time when we have the increase of this trainable parameters that you had also in our practical lecture 10.1 already, of course, here we talk about a different order of scale. These are really cutting edge deep learning algorithms with 25 millions of trainable parameters. And with this, you have, of course, extraordinary performance of these, um, but also on the other hand, they need a lot of computing resources. And in order to satisfy these requirements of these computing resources, we have seen, as you see it on the right-hand side, that you can also use these um, basically training procedures, not only with one GPU, but you use a couple of them together. So here on the right hand say, uh, side, you see basically Europe's number one system, Jubel's, and it has lots of different NVIDIA GPU systems. And what we did here, for instance, on that system, you see there we used 24 nodes where each of the nodes has actually four GPUs. So we ended up with 96 GPUs in parallel to really train this network. And then you see we crunched down the time, um, basically the more GPUs we used, um, in order to train this network. And the technology we used for this was interestingly enough based on MPI. So things you already know with MPI all reduced we had at the beginning of the HPC course is here reduced in a so-called technology horror to enable essentially an exchange in gradients. This gradients of course are the way how you train a network, how you apply the changes of the network then once it is trained and that's why this update is basically important for everyone to catch. And hence you will distribute this information with an L reduce so that of course everybody is basically distributing the information but then also getting the information. So this is really cutting edge technologies uh, using really high scale GPUs for artificial intelligence. And I think that's all I want to leave you on the table here to not take too much time from Shadi. So Shadi, take it from here. Okay, thank you, Morris. Uh, so after this uh, brief summary of what happened during the last lecture, um, we are going to focus specifically on applications of HPC in health and neurosciences. Um, now, uh, 
the thing is that this is going to be just a broad approach of everything that's being done on my side and uh, uh, with the colleagues that I work with in terms of HPC applications and health and neurosciences. We won't go into too many details, but I will provide a brief um, uh, outlook into all of these applications, how they fit into HPC and how they um, they affect the current environment and research in these in these specific fields. So mostly the outline will first of all present the, in, the platform on which we are applying some of this work, which is a Jupyter uh, implementation on the Yulish uh, Supercomputing Center servers. Uh, this application allows access to the HPC resources without really needing to know exactly how HPC resources work. And we'll get to why this is important in a bit. Also, we'll talk about the applications of HPC in healthcare, as I mentioned before. Specifically, I'll provide uh, information about some networks that you may already know and some networks that you might not know of. Uh, I'll also present the three projects that I have worked closely with other colleagues on. One of them is um, uh, one of them is also a master's student possibly like you, possibly looking forward to a PhD position. So it's all something that's within reach for you as well. Um, so without further ado, let's move on and start the lecture then. So HPC resources, as you've already guessed, um, are complicated and using them is also a complicated task. But having access to these resources through an application like Jupyter uh, makes them um, more reachable, more within range of people who are not specifically computer scientists or maybe not specifically computer oriented. Uh, at the Ulysses Supercomputing Center, this is some access uh, that is provided through uh, UDOR, which is the platform through which people can sign up for space on this on, on this platform and also for um, slots to use the uh, supercomputing architecture that's available there. The uh, Jupyter Lab uh, specifically used in this case has access has also um, uh, access to um, modules and packages that are preloaded on the system you only have to select the ones that you need for your application and they will be automatically loaded in your environment. Um, now, Jupyter Lab, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is mostly a, an IDE, just like any other IDE, except it is browser-based. Browser and also for, uh, I guess you know what an IDE is, but I'm just going to mention it. It's an integrated development environment. Uh, so this is a browser-based modular development environment where you can easily attach new modules to it. Uh, in our case, I'm, at least in my case, I'm using it specifically for uh, Python, but you can use it for uh, C if you need. You can use it also for just writing batch scripts and checking if they might work. Um, and uh, with this specific application of Jupyter that's available at the Eulish Supercomputing Center at JSC, uh, you can select the number of nodes that you need. As you can see here, the number of nodes that you select uh, will define how many GPUs you have access to. As, you, as Morris mentioned in the review slide for the work that Rocco was doing, they used up to 24 nodes. Here you can select up to 16 but uh, mostly they use 24 because they were using it, uh, they were accessing it through terminal and through uh, SSH. But uh, regardless, in this case, you can select the number of nodes that you need and depending on which part of the cluster you're using, you have access to one or up to four GPUs per node. Um, the, num the number of minutes for each job that you're going to run on this, uh, on the Jupyter lab environment is also something that you have to predefine and it's limited in this case so that uh, for example nobody forgets their Jupyter lab open and then they take up too many resources without actually using them which as you already know is already something pretty bad you're just wasting CPU or NGPU time. 
But with uh, all of this uh, online access or browser-based access to the supercomputing cluster, you have also access to remote storage, which is a, a, an ideal situation for someone who is using, let's say, as Rocco is using um, uh, multi-dimensional images, or in my case, millions of patient files where we cannot store them locally. It's unfeasible to, to store locally, but if these storage clusters are specifically made for images, for databases, and they have the, uh, the access to these storage sites that is well, well designed for high-speed connections. And it's also uh, efficient and effective for this kind of applications. So with that in mind, let's talk about the specific hardware that we're using. In one specific case, if we're talking about the, uh, the DAM module, the data analytics module of the deepest project, this is one small part of the supercomputing cluster. And as you can see here, it has uh, like cutting edge NVIDIA uh, GPUs. It has a, a large amount of memory in terms of um, random access memory, RAM. And it also has a lot of non-volatile non -volatile memory, two terabytes per node. Uh, and if you scale it up, in this case, I think DAM has about 16 nodes and you have access to all of them. Uh, there are other parts of the cluster that have similar specs. And there's an extension to the DAM prototype, which is called, uh, to the DAM module, which is the prototype, where, where each node has four GPUs. This is specifically designed for machine learning. Uh, and it has also, uh, and you can access it also through Slurm, which you already know how to use. But in our case, we can also access it through Jupyter JSC, as I mentioned before. Now, the work that I'm doing is, um, falls under two specific parts. One of them is, part of the uh, German um, Smith project. Here on the right side, you can see it's the Smart Medical Information Technology for Healthcare. This is a project under the BMBF, which is the German Ministry for Research and Education, if I remember correctly. But it groups together some of the major university clinics in Germany. And they come together under the umbrella of this project in order to set up the means by which they share information and they apply this information for research. Our specific part of this project is in the um, ASIC systems group, which is the algorithmic surveillance of intensive care patients. And specifically speaking, we'll talk about what exactly we're doing for this project in one of the following slides. But, uh, but at the same time, we're also working as part of the Icelandic HPC community, which you can see here on the, right, on the left side. The Icelandic HPC community, we, uh, in the Icelandic HPC community, we are part of the simulation uh, and data lab for health and medicine. And as well, we are applying this knowledge that we gained in the German projects for the benefit of the Icelandic HPC community and for the Icelandic healthcare community. So uh, hopefully within a short period of time, we would have some connections with the university clinic, maybe get access to some of their data and start working on that data in order to maybe improve outcomes for specific diseases, maybe also uh, be able to extract information and uh, in parallel with the work that Decogenetics, for example, is working on, or uh, maybe uh, cooperate with Alvotech, everyone, everything is within reach in this case, but mostly setting up the groundwork for an Icelandic HBC community for health and medicine is the work that we are setting up right now. Now, with that in mind, Let's go into the gist of it. So the first part of this um, HPC and healthcare 
um, lecture is about the data types that you have. So as you know, data comes in different types and each type has a specific application that you can do with it. Uh, the, the approach that you can do for let's say image data is probably not the same that you would do for multispectral images or maybe not the same that you would do for um, uh, speech or text-based data. So specifically speaking, numerical data, uh, uh, technically all data is numerical in this case, but uh, the, the, the way these numbers relate one to another defines the kind of data that you're working on and limits the approaches that you can do with it or the approaches through which you can process this data. Um, some data, the order in, in which it arrives is important, and that would be the case for text-based data or medical signals, uh, heart rate, uh, the uh, ECG of a person, brain waves, for example, if you've ever seen a sleep pattern for a person, you can see the alpha, beta, and delta waves. Uh, speech waveforms, which are currently being relayed to record this session, all of these are used by uh, uh, by ML engineers, and it's um, it's being used also um, through machine learning algorithms to detect, for example, uh, the um, uh, Siri call, or maybe when you ask Google to do something for you, or Alexa to turn on the lights or off. All of these uh, have applications of uh, machine learning, but in um, time series data. Time series data in this case is any data that has a specific a time signature for each time step of it. Other types of data, for example, are images. In this case, we have the, an example of the MNIST database, which is one of the basic applications of uh, image processing in machine learning. But also there are multispectral data or hyperspectral data. This data is mostly provided by satellites, as you may have seen with uh, the uh, lecture that was given by Roku. So, as I mentioned, specific machine learning approaches are developed for each data type. And uh, the specific machine learning approaches take advantage of the data type, but also they are designed to uh, specifically extract the information that we need from this data. So for example, uh, in the case of convolutional neural networks, which you also saw with, uh, with Rocco or Gabriele, I'm not sure, uh, those neural networks would work for images because they understand the relationship between several parts of a multi-layered image, but they might not be applicable for uh, speech data because in this case, the data is only two-dimensional, which is time versus uh, frequency. Whereas for images, you have the, 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 the color layers, which are the third dimension. So um, it, every, every approach requires its specific, um, specific machine learning approach and machine learning algorithms. And being able to know which one to apply where is one of the major parts of the, um, the work of a machine learning scientist and also it comes with the experience that you have with the specific data that you have. Recurrent neural networks, for example, are one application specifically designed for time series data. It is very good at analyzing speech and text and also time series data sets like the one I mentioned before with, um, with medical, uh, medical signals. As you, may have, as you may know from the previous lectures on convolution, convolutional neural networks, these networks are really good at exploiting spatial geometry of their inputs, and they apply some form of convolution and pooling, either maximum pooling or uh, average pooling, in order to uh, abstract the images that they have and extract features from them. And from there, uh, decide, make some decision or prediction on what the image contains, maybe use it also for localization within the image, maybe detect several objects within one image. But for recurrent neural networks, 
these, ex these networks specifically exploit the sequential nature of inputs because they have within them a memory aspect. So instead of passing the, uh, the data all at the same time, each part of the data passes through the model and provides an output, but also keeps a memory within it that will be used to define the output of the next data signal. So uh, it's mentioned here that RNNs are used to create sequence models whereby the occurrence of an element in the sequence is dependent on the elements that appeared before it. This is specifically the definition that is provided and in terms of like the text, or this is the definition that you would find in a textbook for RNNs. But the next slide, we will talk about a specific type of RNNs, which is applicable nowadays, which I have applied in one of my projects. And you can see exactly what I meant by the memory aspect of it. So in this case, we are talking about LSTMs and GRUs. LSTMs are long short-term memory networks and GRUs are gated recurrent units. Both of them are RNNs, technically. They apply the same type of reasoning to a neural network, except that they have more um, activation functions within them, and they also have some, um, uh, some learning happening within them that is more advanced than recurrent neural networks. In this case, you can see that the networks, the, the neurons in this case are chained one to the other where each one takes an input, but also the input that came before it and the input that comes after it and pro produces hypotheses. Each hypothesis is related to its input, but also to the input that came before through this branch and the input that, and will affect the input that comes after through this branch as well. So by chaining these neurons together, you can affect the final output by uh, the data that came before. And you can also define, a, by training the network, you are training all of the layers at the same time through all of the data at the same time. If you zoom out from all of it, it might look specifically like a CNN, but it's, uh, in this case, it's, um, the, the, the difference is very subtle, but it takes some time and some effort working in this field to know exactly uh, how to apply this. It's very easy to, to just build a network with RNNs, but it's very difficult to get it to work properly. And you need to have a very intuitive understanding of how they work in order to be able to apply them. In this case, on the right side at the top of the screen, you can see an example of a medical data set. And uh, in this case, you have at the top side the uh, heart rate in terms of electrical signals. And um, this would be the breathing rate, I think. And then the blue one would be SpO2, the um, uh, saturation of blood in, in oxygen. Uh, this data, for example, is specifically time series data. Every part of it is related to whatever came before it. And there are many things that are underlying this relationship between these signals. The heart rate might increase for absolutely no reason, or at least no apparent reason. But there are some underlying factors that might affect it maybe the breathing rate reduced, so the heart rate has to increase in order to supply oxygen. Maybe um, there are uh, some drugs that have been input for the patient that would cause this kind of reduction in, uh, in uh, breathing rate or might cause this increase in heart rate or might cause uh, an expansion of the arteries, for example. So these are, uh, this is a specific example where it might be beneficial to be able to draw predictions based on this time series data. So you apply a neural network, a, a, re a recurrent neural network on this data, and you uh, try to use it to understand what are the underlying factors for these changes, or uh, give it all of the inputs that you have, 
And from all of these inputs, you have a network that uncovers these relationships, these underlying relationships between the data, or maybe extracts um, information that you might not have found when you were looking at the data yourself, or maybe a hundred scientists at the same time would not have been able to extract this data. Or it might be able to provide prediction, which is one thing that we tried in one case. And, uh, and so, all of this, all of these applications of neural networks in medical time series um, highlight the fact that hundreds or maybe thousands of researchers sitting in front of computers, uh, maybe 24 hours a day for years, would not be able to extract as much information as a single neural network would have been able to within um, a week. Because if a neural network is specifically designed for such a task, that's exactly what it's going to do, and it's going to do it more efficiently. And nowadays, with the digitalization of, of health records through electronic health records, which almost every hospital in the world has, you have access to huge data sets, which, of course, a normal machine cannot, cannot go through. But at least these data sets are available for research. They can be mined for information or for in, uh, data that might be beneficial for solving the long-term problems that we haven't been able to solve using traditional medicine. So applying these new um, or recent, because none of these uh, machine learning algorithms are new anymore because there's been so much research done on them, but applying them on new problems helps us solve very old problems that we've had as humans. So this is exactly what I was mentioning in terms of solving problems. If you have a database and an algorithm that you want to use for a specific condition. You cannot directly use them for the computers that are available at the hospitals because that computer may not be built for that kind of application or it may not be able to hold that much information to process it and to provide um, outputs. But if you go through research institutions, you can use their available efficient storage. You can use their um, uh, CPU and GPU architecture. You can use all of their high performance computing systems in order to develop a network that would be predictive or di a diagnostic tool, something to assist the doctors in their work. And that specifically would be portable uh, instead of being a huge database and a huge application, both of which might take up hundreds of gigabytes, you have a small network that is technically an application file. It can be at a maximum of 200 megabytes, which is absolutely nothing. And you can run it as an executable on a local machine within the hospital itself. And that way, you would be serving the hospital, but you would be also reducing the overhang, you, you would be reducing the overhead, you would be uh, helping improve outcomes for patients, and you would be providing a quick way, a quick diagnostic tool. Because as you may know, the quicker uh, a person is diagnosed for any condition, the better the outcomes are for, for these conditions. This is specifically the case for ICU patients, where time is of the essence. So to, to summarize it, mostly HPC resources in medical applications are necessary for data storage, for outlier detection in terms of um, maybe cleaning the data, trimming everything that might, be ne might not be necessary. As you know, ICU is a bit noisy, so sometimes the signals are uh, either blend or are not completely recorded. It can help in data preparation and transformation in terms of um, visualizing this information, but also in cleaning it, uh, making it more portable. And it can also be used, HPC in this case, can be used to train predictive models, as I mentioned here, which is also one of the applications that we're working on at this point. So uh, I mentioned this real-world application in the bottom 
um, uh, in the bottom part, where we already have a mechanistic model that is built on calculations. And it's bulky and it has a lot of inputs. What uh, instead we try to do is generate patients um, randomly and uh, as accurately as possible to normal patients. And we run them through this network that, uh, that exists through this mechanistic model. And from the inputs and outputs that we get, we build a neural network that would be able to replace this model, uh, which is more portable than in that case. And this network can be used to um, predict condition or suggest uh, treatment or maybe highlight which treatment would be more effective. Another use case that I was working on with a master student is the COVID net. In this, uh, I, I, let's not kid ourselves, we've all gone through the same pandemic. Um, this was a very difficult time for, for medicine because everyone needed a, a, um, a quick and easy diagnostic tool for patients as they arrive at hospitals. And uh, PCRs would take 24, maybe 48 hours to be ready. And that's not enough time. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a good time when you have a um, serious health condition that might cause death within these 24 or 48 hours. So a team uh, developed a network called COVID-NET, which is a CNN trained on a database of chest x-rays. That database is publicly available and it's called COVID-X. And they apply a system similar to ResNets, which you've uh, seen in the, in the presentation by Rocco, but their approach is somewhat different. Uh, they define it here in, in the diagram presented. And this network is a very good at detecting the, uh, the, uh, the symptoms of COVID within chest x-rays. These are presented here. It's called ground glass texture in, uh, in chest x-rays. These are, by the way, pictures of the same patient before and after onset of COVID-19. So now uh, we're talking about this network being applied, but um, specifically, how does HPC come into the equation? Well, here is, here's how it is. The original chest x-ray database contains 13,975 images. And uh, the network was trained on them, probably using HPC architecture, but we're not sure. Maybe they just applied it the uh, old school style. But in our case, we had data from another outside source that wanted to apply this uh, COVID net in their hospitals. They provided their data through the um, uh, EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud project. And they made this data available to project partners, us included. And this data consisting of um, 1000 images for training and 4000 images for testing was applied to the same network. Now, the first thing you do is try to see if your network knows how to detect COVID from these new images, because they might be different in a different scale or different uh, parameters in them. We had to do some work in that case. We also did some transfer learning and uh, transfer learning here is defined as applying a pre-trained network on a new problem with new data. So you have a network that's pre-trained to detect COVID from normal images. And we are also trying to detect COVID from these images, but also the images that they provided are labeled to other conditions like uh, lung collapse or maybe trauma to the lungs, um, uh, some kind of lung, uh, uh, three different types of lung injury are provided also. So by testing this network on the new images, we uh, highlight where it fails and where it doesn't. And then we can expand to the new data that they provided in terms of the other conditions. And to be able to do all of this efficiently and effectively and within a specific time frame, we have to apply it using uh, the available computer architecture that, at the Eulish Supercomputing Center. So during this project, we applied it using the deep cluster, but also we will be moving on towards using the jewels cluster 
and hopefully this will be the subject of a future publication. Finally, uh, one final use case is neuroscience. And as you can see here, neuroscience is one of the pillars on which HPC design is established. Of course, space weather and radio astronomy are important. Earth science is very um, effective at, uh, for example, detecting where there might be flooding. But neuroscience specifically in this case is uh, an application field where we are trying to map the connections within the brain. And this is the specific uh, application field of the neuroscience and big brain research project, where we are applying the available architecture, the hardware uh, technologies available at the Euler Supercomputing Center, for example, uh, we're accompanying it, them with the uh, libraries and modules and uh, 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 data lab in this case is a data management tool that's based on Git. Uh, I hope some of you know what Git is. I'm pretty sure you do since you are in programming, but using these technologies and this hardware um, on the supercomputing cluster, but also on portable container environments, uh, all of these under specific projects allow the applications of projects. In this case, I'm talking about the neuroscience and big brain research, but we also mentioned the ARDS, time series analysis, which is part of the ASIC project that I mentioned in the beginning. Also the COVID-19 chest x-ray analysis, which I just mentioned. So setting up this groundwork is also a major part of the work being done in HPC for healthcare. So this, uh, this page technically uh, summarizes all of the work that, that needs to be done before you actually apply something for neuroscience or for um, uh, ICU patients or for COVID net, you have to have the proper infrastructure and data storage management. But before doing that, you have to establish the protocols for communication and versioning. But even before that, you need to have the proper software modules but at the most basic level, you need to make sure that you have the proper hardware. And with that in mind, let's move on to the final parts of this presentation. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but recently these two articles came out, um, well, not very recently anymore, but in July 2021, both of these articles were released. Both of them are applications of HPC. In, the, in solving one of the main problems that science, biology, chemistry have been dealing with, which is how proteins fold within the cell. And these two teams were able to do them through communication, but also through some kind of competition. One of them, uh, AlphaFold, is funded by Google. The other one is from another university that was in communication with Google and um, kind of had an idea how they worked and then they did their own approach. In both applications, HPC was used. In both applications, uh, they mentioned exactly how it's used and they mentioned that their work is now publicly available for anyone to expand on, to apply it for their own research. So this is just to highlight how much of a broad field HPC is specifically for healthcare. And the last slide of this lecture is going to be about applications of simulation in HPC for healthcare. And um, this is not for the weak of heart because it's a bit gnarly, let's say, but it highlights how the um, uh, coronavirus spreads within a room during, like with people not wearing masks and during normal conversation. Researchers in Japan used the supercomputer Fugaku to simulate how the novel coronavirus spreads. They looked at a case in which four people are sitting at a dining table and talking without masks on. When someone talks to the person seated in front of them, about 5% of droplets reach the person. When talking to the person sitting diagonally, only one-fourth the amount reach the person. But when looking sideways to talk to the person sitting side by side, more than 25% of droplets reach the person. 
Researchers also found that fewer droplets spread when the humidity is higher. In an office setting, 6% of cough droplets reached a facing person nearly 2 meters away at 30% humidity. The amount dropped to about 2% at 90% humidity. Researchers recommended the use of humidifiers and other measures to reduce the spread of droplets in the dry winter season. So, uh, all of these simulations are very pretty to look at, but mostly they are uh, the results of millions or billions of calculations happening in the background on huge computers and then bringing them together and making this interesting looking video that is at most 30 or 40 seconds long. Um, so uh, all of this work is happening in the background, all of this work is important, and all of it is relevant for uh, um, making predictions, for making some simulations like this one, for improving healthcare or for improving the outcomes of patients, uh, all of this kind of work is important, and um, there is a lot of expansion that can happen in this field. So I hope that by presenting these, you have um, uh, found it interesting. Maybe you are encouraged to join a field, uh, an application field in healthcare. But with that in mind, I think we get to the end of the lecture, and I thank you for, for your attention. I'll just go through the bibliography and the PhD students, I am one of them, presented here with the Outlook for the Future. And I thank you for your attention. All right, yeah, Shadi, very good presentation, very interesting perspective, actually, when we think about what we had before, um, having started a little bit more with remote sensing in the application track, the second half here, now health, the next one will be with RAISA and computational fluid dynamics. So you see HPC has really applications in different domains. And with the spreading of Corona, I think the, the final video you made, Shadi, you made lots of things clear why HPC is relevant and why it can, of course, inform decision makers and governments at large also to help, you know, reducing the spreading of viruses and, and many other, let's say, catastrophic events starting from perhaps volcano activities that we know, but also, of course, earthquakes in San Diego Supercomputing Center, they do lots of those. So it has lots of natural disasters also covered. But yeah, once again, thank you, Shadi. Um, he is also available to you as perhaps one PhD student that is already at the end of the journey almost. So you can maybe contact him if you have interest in thinking about an academic career, what it doesn't mean to be a PhD at the University of Iceland. Shadi also graduated before here from the University of Iceland before he started the PhD. So he has a whole track basically record and he's probably a good guy to talk to if you want to know a little bit more about how the life is as a PhD student. So I think that's all what we have here. Um, once again, thanks Shadi for taking this lecture and the next lecture will be lecture 12 on CFD and Trinita Elemente. See you then.